Hello there and welcome once again to The Verdict. Mick Cornett along with Kent Myers. We're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues. We welcome back an old friend this week. Yes, Patty Davis, the president of the Oklahoma Hospital Association, is going to join us and talk about what we've labeled, she didn't, but we've labeled crisis in Oklahoma hospitals. With COVID going on like it is, mm -hmm. our hospitals are, uh, are suffering mightily, as are the patients, of course, and the staff. It's a very, very difficult situation, and we thought we'd give our viewers an update on where it is now. Good of her to come back. There's always issues to talk about with hospitals in Oklahoma. So we'll yep. get the latest with Patty Davis today on The Verdict. We'll be right back. Right now, six feet can feel like a long ways away. But from six feet, we can still smile at each other. From our doorways and our stairways, from opposite sides of the street and opposite sides of the country, through fear and frustrations, we can remind each other that we are still here for each other because we can still smile at each other and we're not going anywhere. There's a lot of just emotions that you go through when the doctor tells you that your daughter has leukemia. And your first question is, well, how long do we have? When I found out I had leukemia, I don't really remember what the day was like. I just remember that part just because it was scary. I was just worried, and I was worried about my parents, too. I think Rachel's story is very inspiring. She had a lot happened to her kind of at a pivotal point in her life, preteen, and she had to grow up really fast, and she took it all in stride. She never asked why this happened to me. She's always been strong through everything. When I grew up, I want to be a pediatrician. Just helping other kids, it'll mean a lot to me. And that's Rachel's heart. She wants to help others. She wants to encourage them. My name is Rachel Scott, and I am Chickasaw. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at ProfilesOfANation.com. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. Kent's going to introduce today's guest. It is always a pleasure to have uh, Patty Davis join us on the show and tell us what's going on with uh, herself and the Oklahoma Hospital Association. Uh, Patty is president of the Oklahoma Hospital Association, has been since 2018. She originally joined the, the association uh, 17, 18 years ago and stayed there about that length of time, then uh, joined OU Medicine for two or three years and in 2018 was selected as president of the Hospital Association again. Uh, she did her undergraduate work at the University of Oklahoma in political science, and she also is a graduate of the Masters of Legal Studies program in healthcare law. Uh, she um, has been on our show two or three times, and we're trying to decide how many, uh, but several, and she's always a lot of good information, sometimes hard to hear, but always good information, and Patty, welcome back. Sure glad to have you. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me back. Sure. How have you been? What's the state of hospitals in the state? Well, I know that we're all reading every day different news alerts, literally citing the numbers of COVID. And that's where the association is spending the bulk of our time or trying to help our hospitals manage through this latest surge. So right now our hospitals are very full. Uh, we watch numbers daily, and I know we're taping this uh, a few days before this will air. So literally, this situation changes in Oklahoma every single day, and we watch for trend lines. And we watch for trend lines over several days to try to uh, normalize what we're seeing. But clearly, hospitalizations are still on the rise, mm -hmm. and we are also watching what's going on in the pediatric space since school has started back. Space is an issue, beds are an issue, staffing is an issue, but the federal government's putting a lot of money into, into that side of it. I assume that that's very helpful, if not uh, solving the financial aspect of it. Well, yes, in the first round of surge, there were a number of funding packages that, that were very, very helpful. 
Now we are uh, in the state of Oklahoma. There's a little different process this time uh, for how the American Rescue Act money allocated for Oklahoma will be disseminated, and there is a legislative uh, work group that's going to be responsible for that. So uh, we are in discussions with how we would like to see some of that money being doled back out for health care. Uh, Patty, I know you are president of the Hospital Association. How many member hospitals do you have? We have 117 hospital members. And they're spread throughout the state, I think? Absolutely, it? all over Oklahoma. And we're talking from the smallest critical access hospitals to our large systems. We also have tribal facilities uh, that are members. Are you seeing any hospitals in particular uh, geographic areas that are being harder hit than some of the remainder of the hospitals? Well, just like we started watching what was going on in uh, Missouri and Arkansas started moving yeah. east into Oklahoma, that has been the trend because our Easter, eastern hospitals initially started feeling the brunt. Likewise, the smaller hospitals would transfer into Tulsa. So this is just spread to the west. And clearly, as of the data last night that I looked at, we have Tulsa leading with the most COVID hospitalizations, followed not surprisingly by Oklahoma City. But now we were surprised to see the Southwest numbers uh, for COVID surpass Northeast numbers. So we look at this by regions and we try to analyze that and, and try to help as best we can. Can you identify any particular events uh, that might have been super spreader events that causes more of a problem for you than there's any, otherwise. any number of those. And just like in the first search, what we learned, when we see an increase in positivity, it's about two weeks and then we start seeing an increase in hospitalization. Unfortunately, about two weeks after that, we'll start seeing an increase in deaths. And the difference in this surge from the last surge is this appears to be the pandemic of the unvaccinated. Our hospitals are reporting that their admissions are younger uh, they are also uh, patients that haven't been vaccinated. And many times, these younger folks are people that are otherwise healthy, have no other underlying condition that find themselves getting sick very rapidly and needing the services of a hospital. So are stays shorter? Is there, uh, are the, is this current virus less deadly? Where, where have we moved in the last year? Well, this virus is certainly more, way more contagious, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, with a younger population, uh, some may be able to bear it without any significant need for hospital care, but others are not. Now, one good, really good thing that's available that the public is probably not as aware as they need to be is in the first round, monoclonal antibodies were available for people with certain conditions to be able to head off a more serious con condition. You might remember President Trump got those, and those are available in Oklahoma. So I would urge viewers that find themselves with a COVID diagnosis to talk to their physician about whether or not they would be a candidate for monoclonal antibodies because we think it could prevent further hospitalization or even potentially um, death. Mm -hmm. now, if a hospital fills up, what happens next? Do they? start trying to move a patient to a different hospital or they try to, to uh, have people go home? What, what, what are the options? Oh, there are a lot of options. And we have hospital surge plans that they all developed last year. We have hospitals that are already working in their surge plans. The first thing they try to do is internally they try to manage. So for a larger hospital, that may be, well, we're going to cut down this, this unit for a particular thing and repurpose mm -hmm. that staff to take care of COVID or medical surgical Some sort patients. of electi elective surgeries might be rescheduled. Yes, we, yeah. have, we have hospitals right now that have been doing that for a while, determining what can wait safely versus mm -hmm. what's absolutely urgent, emergent, that has to be dealt with. And unfortunately, what is a little different than last time, last time when the state shut down, a lot of people took this as a pass not to go to their doctor, not to take their medicine, not to take care of themselves. So our hospitals told us when this one started rolling in that their beds were already full of patients that had neglected conditions and got very ill. So they're patients that very much need to be in the hospital. Then we start seeing rising COVID numbers. So um, all of our hospitals are full. ICU beds 
are at an absolute premium. Yesterday morning when I got to work, there was one ICU bed available in the state. By the time I, I went to bed, everyone was still scrambling. So there are patients holding. Uh, I don't want to be an alarmist, but this is a significant issue, and this is not just an issue for patients with COVID. This affects if you should have a heart attack or a stroke. You know, your care um, is going to possibly be delayed just because we are, we are having waits in our emergency room. What are the alternative, reasonable alternatives to an ICU bed? If, if typically the diagnosis would be that the patient needs ICU treatment, but there are no ICU beds available, what is a reasonable alternative if there is one? Well, the reasonable alternative is to prevent the need for an ICU bed is get the vaccine. Mm. And then we go back to all the things that we knew before about watch where you go, be socially distanced from others, wear masks, do hand washing, all the preventive things that we all know we're supposed to do. But quite simply, in terms of an intensive care bed, uh, we very much appreciate the health department through emergency rules made it possible for hospitals to have flexibility. So right now we know we have hospitals using their um, post-acute uh, units where they normally would bring someone out of surgery. Those are equipped with medical gases. We know hospitals are using those for intensive care level beds. Uh, but, you know, intensive care level beds mean that they come with a lot of extra equipment and a lot of technology as well as a highly trained professional caregiver at the bedside. And I have to absolutely say our caregivers are fatigued, whether it's physicians, it's nurses, it's respiratory therapists, and all the people that support them. They're absolutely fatigued. And right now we know in this surge that we have around 200 less nurses practicing at the bedside in Oklahoma than we had in our last surge. Let's jump to a break. Uh, nursing shortages, um, why more people aren't getting vaccinated, some of the topics we want to discuss when we get back. Sure. Sure. Listening to Patty Davis, we'll return on the verdict. The Vet Hero Office at the University of Central Oklahoma, it is a one-stop shop for veterans when they're trying to get their education. I call it my encore job. I get to take care of veterans. We help them transition. I was that guy that transitioned after 24 years, and in the end, GI Bill is a benefit that those soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marine earned. It was the thing that made us the greatest country in the world coming out of World War II, and it will continue to do the same thing for this future generation of service members. OU Law has a history and heritage that are unparalleled. At the University of Oklahoma College of Law, we empower our students to pursue the career of their dreams. We have the highest U.S. news ranking ever achieved by an Oklahoma law school. We are the first law school in the country to launch a college-wide digital initiative. And this year, our competition teams rank number two in the nation. OU Law, generations of excellence, limitless possibilities. We're back. Our guest is Patty Davis uh, with the Oklahoma Hospital Association. Uh, Patty, when we took a break, uh, we were uh, talking, you were talking about the staffing uh, folks being worn out, exhausted, uh, very stressed, obviously. Uh, and you also said that you're dealing with uh, the possibility of 200 fewer nurses available now than were available in the first surge. What accounts for that diminution of 200 nurses? over that relatively short period of time. Well, quite simply, Kent, some just decided it was a good time to retire or they just couldn't do this anymore. This is, this is incredibly difficult work day in, day out. And some are just like, I can't do it anymore. The other thing is during the other surge uh, under the executive order and then the public health declaration, our Board of Nursing had additional flexibility where we could use retirees or people perhaps who had a license in good standing but had not renewed. We had ability to use students in a, in a broader way. And we are right now working with the State Board of Nursing to ask for as much flexibility as they can possibly give 
perhaps through an emergency rule, and we're in that process right now. I will have to say the Board of Nursing has a really excellent um, fast track application process. So uh, we are competing globally for nurses right now, and that makes it very wow. difficult in Oklahoma. What are hospitals doing to try and address it? Are they offering uh, increased compensation, for instance, to try and urge <coughs> people out of retirement? What, what are the options for them? Well, right now, a lot of our nurses are using staffing companies, and um, they're national staffing companies. And the uh, hourly rates are very, very exorbitant and continue to climb. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can't forget about the people that have been at the bedside that have stuck all the way through. Mm -hmm. And so from hospital to hospital, we're hearing different things that they're doing to, to try to make sure that their staff know that they're appreciated for what they're doing. And uh, we've got a lot of hospitals trying creative things uh, to do everything they can to have the caregivers that they need. Well, and, and this problem of staffing is not limited to Oklahoma, of course. It's right. nationwide, pres I presume. Uh, <clears throat> so we're in competition with a lot of other folks to get nurses that want to come in here and, and go to work. And I suspect that's pretty steep competition. It is very steep competition, but for over 10 years, uh, the health care providers have been studying the workforce shortages that we have in Oklahoma. And quite simply, um, we've studied it to death. Uh, this is not something that, you know, is totally unforeseen. We are not graduating enough registered nurses. And why is that? Because we don't have enough instructors to teach. And so it's, it's all tied into a matter of where we prioritize our funding on education to create more capacity to serve the future. That's not an immediate fix, mm -hmm. but long term, that's definitely something that we've got to pay attention to. You mentioned earlier in the show that many of the patients are unvaccinated. Yes. What efforts are being made to increase the number of vac evac evacuations? vaccinations? Well, I, I follow social media closely. It's unfortunately that this pandemic has become a political issue because let's make no mistake, pandemics are not about politics. It's basic public health. We have never seen a situation like this ever where we've had such vaccine hesitancy, the amount of misinformation that exists out there. So it is a never-ending search to try to educate folks. And yesterday, with the emergency use authorization coming off of Pfizer, I hope that encourages some that were hesitant to go ahead and say, okay, I need to do this. But these drugs are not experimental. They have been approved through the FDA, just like drugs have to be approved in Oklahoma and the and, and nationwide. Mm -hmm. So it's it's been so politicized that the misinformation abounds, and, and I will just say, uh, literally, for your family members, don't bet your life on misinformation. You know, if you're wrong, your life is a terrible toll to place on this. What can you tell us about booster shots? Well, I know yesterday, uh, what I heard, and I know there's a lot out there, mm -hmm. we're hearing eight months from your second shot, and uh, I know that in Oklahoma, boosters are available. Uh, the Patients that have particularly uh, conditions like autoimmune, uh, cancer treatment, there are a list that you should, should ask your doctor, is it time for me to get it? Because many people uh, that have those pre-existing conditions may be eligible to go ahead and receive those early. But for the rest of us, you know, we're hearing eight months after the second shot. And certainly I will be in line as soon as I can get that third shot. I will do, do so. As will we. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Let me ask you another question about the booster shot. Mm -hmm. Is it the same vaccine that we got, for instance, uh, I got Pfizer, mm -hmm. shots one and two. Mm -hmm. If I get a Pfizer booster, is it the same uh, stuff uh, put in me again for strengthening of the immunity, or is it a different cocktail, if you will? I know that this is running and this is live, and quite truthfully, that's for the clinicians because that is not something that I am prepared to answer. Okay. Well... I shouldn't have even asked. Yeah. I don't so. know what I would have done with your answer, <laughs> frankly. I still yeah. would have gotten the yeah. booster shot. Right. I'm assuming that it is, but I don't want to speak unequivocally mm -hmm. because I am not a clinician. Yeah. Let me change the subject just a little bit, if we can. 
Uh, let's focus uh, on the expanded Medicaid in Oklahoma at a time of a COVID crisis. And what uh, uh, help, if any, is it giving? Well, that's a great question. Medicaid expansion officially began July 1. I'm pleased to announce uh, we have a little more than 165,000 Oklahomans have signed up since uh, enrollment became open, which was June the 1st. So for our hospitals, it's a little yet to see because July 1, they enrolled. And it's important to note that we expected around 200,000 Oklahomans to be eligible. Wow. These 200,000 Oklahomans are working individuals, sometimes one job, sometimes two or three jobs that don't have insurance. We need, for the most part, many of these people are healthy. So we don't expect to see them in hospitals until they need it. But given where we are with COVID, are we thankful that this option exists? Absolutely, because we know there are people out of work still, and we know that uh, COVID is not a respecter of whether or not you have insurance or you're a Democrat or Republican. Uh, we know when people need health care, they need health care. So we are pleased to see that we have this many people enrolled. And we know the health care authority will still be working to get people um, identified in a primary care medical home, meaning hooked up with a doctor that will be their medical home, and that they can start getting preventive care early rather than waiting until they're really sick and showing up in the emergency room. So. We are pleased with the rollout, and uh, we think the timing couldn't be more uh, important. Well, let me follow up on that just a little bit. I think you said that there, were an est there was an estimate of 200,000 Oklahomans eligible right. for Medicaid, and you're telling us that within a relatively short period of time, you've already enrolled, or the system has enrolled 165,000. Right. Isn't that a rather startlingly favorable result? It is, but it's important to remember why those numbers are so large. Prior to Medicaid expansion, uh, the only way you could qualify if you were related by category, meaning your age, blind and disabled, or a pregnant woman and child, and you had to be under a certain income level. So the Oklahoma Health Care Authority, our Medicaid agency, also had some programs such as family planning services, such as a breast and cervical uh, program for low-income women that did not qualify before. So the Health Care Authority took a look at who had in the last six months applied and not, not been eligible, plus they look at that population that are in other programs that because they're low income that they would meet the thresholds. So the Oklahoma Health Care Authority very diligently has worked through those populations, and that's why we've got this shot in the arm, as it were, in initial enrollment. Just a few seconds left. <clears throat> uh, what do you want to tell Oklahomans who are watching this show? First off, if you haven't gotten a vaccine, don't wait. Please go get a vaccine because those vaccines save lives. Talk to your doctor about it if you are hesitant. There's lots of facts and figures out there, and please do not bet your life on something that you read on social media. Uh, because that is just too sad for all of us, and uh, that's what I want everyone to know. It's not too late to get a vaccine. Please do that. All right. Patty, thanks so much for coming on The Verdict. Yeah, thank you. We really appreciate it. Kent and I will have a final word when we return. It used to be okay in teachers' lounges. It used to be okay in maternity wards. It was okay in sporting arenas, college campuses, and office spaces. But now that we understand the deadly dangers of secondhand smoke, that's not okay anymore. So why is it okay that thousands of employees are exposed to it every day at work? Bottom line, it's not okay. Let's protect hardworking Oklahomans. Join the fight at StopsWithMe.com. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23-CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, 
helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. I think for us, once we got started and we began to see the tremendous need um, just within our state, um, it really was just a calling for us. The blessings far outweigh any obstacles that we've faced. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. Welcome back to The Verdict. Patty Davis was our guest with the Oklahoma Hospital Association. Some, some dour comments, uh, but very realistic on uh, the status of our Oklahoma hospitals now with the, the COVID virus flaring back up. Well, yes, uh, I was talking with my wife, who's a producer on this show, and she suggested that we do a show, an update, if you will, on what COVID has done with the hospitals. And uh, I think uh, Patty was an excellent spokesperson to bring that information out. You know, Mick, Somebody said, it's not original with me, but a COVID shot is free and a hospital stay is not. <laughs> and um, if, the, uh, if you get the shot, you may not have to have the hospital stay. So many of the things we're going through right now are familiar. I mean, we have been, you know, a, a shortage of hospitals around the state for a number of years, a shortage of nurses. That's not a new topic, but you can imagine the stress that's been placed on our caregivers over the last few months, a uh, year and a half now. And it's, it's, uh, it's very understandable that there are fewer people at this stage wanting to get it in the industry or wanting to stay in the industry yeah. if they have the opportunity to retire. Yeah, it's startling that we lost 200 nurses from COVID Surge 1 to COVID Surge 2. We have some website information. Let's take a look. You can get more information from Patty and her work at OKOHA. That's OKOHA.com. And we have a website, theverdict.tv. So log on, tell us about a guest you'd like to see or a topic you'd like to see us discuss, and we'll do our best to bring it to you. For Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We'll see you next week right here on another edition of The Verdict.